Well, whether you're a fairly young Christian or you have been serving the Lord for many years, whenever you open up the Bible, whenever you study uh, the Scriptures, I believe that there's always something new to learn. You can visit the same passage and the Holy Spirit will show you something uh, brand new that is relevant to your life. And uh, this is why it's a, a, a holy book. It's scripture. It's not just a book. It's sacred. And God speaks to us through it. So today I pray that that is the same, that the words of my heart, or my mouth rather, and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in the Lord's sight. I'd like to begin with seven, the number seven. That's the number of days for creation, and the judgments of Revelation are collected in groups of seven. Twelve, that's the number for the tribes of Israel. It also happens to be the number of disciples that Jesus chose to follow. Forty, that's the number of the days for the flood. That's the years of wandering through the wilderness and the days and nights of Jesus' temptation. Numbers in Scripture, they're important. And they demonstrate God's intentionality. They demonstrate the scope of His plan. There are no coincidences. When you read the Bible, remember that. There is nothing there that isn't intentionally there, and there are no coincidences. Everything has meaning. The number three. The number three. God reveals Himself as three persons. We are made in His image. We are formed body, soul, and spirit. Peter denies Jesus three times. Jesus questions Peter's, Peter's love three times. Do you love me more than these? Jesus speaks of the sign of Jonah, who was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, alluding to his resurrection prophetically. Dead for three days, on the third day he rose again. In fact, Jesus was crucified on the third hour, buried and raised on the third day. It's all about the number three. We are just scratching the surface. Now, we've been tracking the actual words of Jesus, often printed in red in your Bibles. And today we are reflecting on John chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. You already know about the event. You do. Jesus is in the temple. And he turns over tables. He evicts the salesmen. The money changers. Jesus causes chaos. Who would have the guts to do something like that? So radical and so bold. Who would push against the authorities? The religious police... Police corner him and they ask, what sign can you show us to prove that you have the authority to do all this? In today's language, you might ask, what are your credentials? Where's your badge that gives you the right to behave like this? In Jesus' day, the badge for that kind of behavior in the temple was some sort of demonstration of supernatural power. That's the only thing that would justify what he did. And Jesus said to them, here's the red letters. He said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in, in three days. They replied, um, excuse me, it has taken 46 years to build this temple. And you tell us you're going to destroy it, and it will be raised in three days? But the temple he was speaking of wasn't the one with brick and mortar. He was speaking of his body. And only in hindsight, after his resurrection, would the disciples look back and remember these words and record them. So here we are. Jesus declares that he has the authority on the basis of his third day resurrection. Now, do you need evidence of his right to act 
and to tell you what's what. <coughs> Here it is. On the third day, he rose from the dead. That's the only answer you're given. What right does he have to tell you how to live your life? On the third day, he rose from the dead. Now, interesting, as we soak ourselves in these passages. This incident of turning tables, and these words is found in John chapter 2, are recorded by John as if it happened right after Jesus turned the water into wine. The other gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they have this event occurring towards the end of his ministry. So either John has put it at the beginning for editorial or messaging purposes, or it happened twice. We don't know. All we do know is that John has it early on. And he writes, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Up to Jerusalem. How many of you know Jerusalem was built on a hill? He went, they went up to Jerusalem. It's, it, everything is intentional. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables, exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them all through the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who sold the doves, he said, Get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. His disciples remembered a prophecy. Zeal for your house will consume. An angry Jesus. How many of you like to think of Jesus as angry? On other occasions, Jesus refers to himself as someone who's meek and mild, humble of heart. And yet on this occasion, we see another side to the Savior. We see Anger. Now the Greeks had three words for anger. This is fascinating to me. Because there are different kinds of anger. Depending on what provokes you, will determine what kind of anger you present. And interestingly enough, all three kinds of anger are mentioned by the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 4. Every one of them is mentioned. The first one is in Ephesians 4.31, when it says to put away anger. The Greek word is thumos. That sounds like a good word for anger, doesn't it? Thumos. This is the kind of anger when you are personally offended. When somebody mistreats you, gossips about you, you're on the receiving end of injustice. This is the anger you will feel and it often provokes a blowout. You have a thumos kind of anger. How dare you? The Bible says put away that anger. No place for it. This is not the anger that Jesus demonstrate. The second kind of anger is paragismus. This is the word from Ephesians 4.26 where it says, do not let the sun go down upon your wrath. This is the anger in response to irritation. So this is, this is the anger you feel when somebody keeps saying, hurry up, hurry up. Or when somebody cuts you off in traffic and you go, Rrr. This is the anger that prompts road rage, and of course, sometimes this causes you to, to demonstrate what you're feeling. But this is not the kind of anger that Jesus is presenting here either. This is not just an irritation. The third kind of anger is called org. These are all Greek words. Ephesians 4.26, be angry. Ah, this is a permissible anger. Be angry and sin not. This is the kind of anger that responds to something that is morally wrong and clearly offensive to God. You can call it righteous indignation if you want. And this is the anger that Jesus is presenting in the temple. It's not a, 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 a reckless emotional outburst. It's a matter, it's, or rather, it's not a matter of blowing a fuse. It's an intentional statement. It's an intentional reaction to something that is deeply wrong. It's org anger. And so we have to step back and we have to then immerse ourselves into the passage and say, what on earth was so deeply wrong that Jesus would become indignant on a righteous basis? 
What were the salesmen and money changers doing that was so offensive? And why did Jesus radically chase them out? Well, it was Passover. We're not Jewish, so we don't understand the significance of Passover to the degree that a Jewish Christian would. This was the most important celebration of the Jewish culture commemorating their release from bondage from Egypt. This was the Passover celebration. It was a worship event where you acknowledge God, His greatness, and the mighty deeds He has done. Now, it was the custom for family, people, to make an annual journey to Jerusalem for the Passover. And the reason for going to Jerusalem is because that's where the temple was situated. And that's where all God's people were to congregate together to make their sacrifices, to make their worship. And this is important. Don't let this slip by. Further to that, each family was to present an offering. We worship differently, but they were to bring the first fruits, the best, the firstborn of their livestock. Something from their own livestock. Deuteronomy 16.2. Now, admittedly, this is difficult. Imagine the challenges associated with traveling to Jerusalem. We don't have automobiles. It's a two, three-day journey, arduous journey, de depending on distance, depending on terrain, but it is rough terrain, and the expectation that you were to bring the best livestock from your own herd with you. Not easy. Very difficult. Extremely inconvenient. Years previous, one of the kings, Jeroboam, had this cockamamie idea that he could win the favor of the people by making worship more convenient. Instead, of folks, of having to go to Jerusalem, I will allow you to come to places like Bethel or Dan, and instead of you're all worried that they won't have the Ark of the Covenant there, we'll engrave you other things. The important thing is, is to make Jerusalem, or to make the place of worship rather for you accessible. To make it more convenient. Well, the Lord shut that idea down. He dealt with Jeroboam harshly because worship is not about convenience, it's about God. Now, this is where it gets a little personal for us. Because many years later, Jesus visits the temple. And what does he find? He finds salesmen. They're selling doves and livestock, sheep and oxen, for sacrifice. No need to bring your own as commanded. Just conveniently buy a sacrifice when you arrive. We are here to make your worship experience more convenient, less step stressful. Step right up. We'll give you what you need. You see what's going on here? The money changers, called Shunai, could take whatever currency you brought from your local area and they could exchange it into the currency being used in Jerusalem. And you could buy your sacrifice seamlessly. The Shulhani could also take large sums and break it down into smaller ones. Or they could also hold it for you. If you're carrying too much, let us put it in a safety deposit box, as it were. Of course, all for just a little fee. The Passover worship experience was being reduced to convenience. And as such, the heart of sacrifice was being squeezed out. Pay God off with as little bother as possible. And additionally, they had moved into the temple. It's not enough that they're doing this, but let's make it even more convenient and bring the whole rigmarole inside. And so org anger kicks in. What provokes Jesus is, is that the heart of worship has been distorted into religious duty made convenient. And we go back and we think of King David's words. God said of King David that he had a heart after him. And here is things that King David would say. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. 
You shall love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Lord, I don't want to present before you a divided heart. I present before you a whole heart. And these people were demonstrating divided hearts. They were, they were wanting to and they were willing to worship God, but it was on their terms. It was contrary to what God had asked. They took the way of convenience to pacify. Wow. How many of you knew that when you read that story? That's what's really going on here. Everybody thinks it's because they were they had merchandising going on inside the walls. That's not what's wrong here at all. It's the motive. And so Jesus cleanses the temple. Listen to his words, John 2, 16. Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a place of merchandise. Now this occasion leaves me asking two big questions. Number one. Do I ever compromise my worship to God at His house by avoiding the difficult and only doing what is convenient? Does tiredness, distance, moodiness, or other obligations affect my decision and efforts to worship God at His house with His people? We like our microwaves, drive through coffee, but has convenience seeped into our practice of worship? Is my heart divided? Am I giving God my best? No matter what. Susie will tell you my love language is gifts. Some of you know that. It's not that I'm looking for a gift all the time. But on occasion you want to say, hey pastor, we love you. You can hug me. That's Bob's thing. <laughs> Where is Bob? <laughs> He's gone. He's afraid of all the hugs. Um, I don't mind a hug. But a gift, it doesn't even have to be expensive, but something thoughtful. But when you're given a gift, and you know the thought isn't in it, it was just, they went out and that'll do, or they haven't given it any really thought about who you were or what you might appreciate. It's like, why did you bother? I wonder if God ever feels like that. When we're just approaching Him with, that'll do. Wow. Number two, question. I realize that not only did Jesus refer to Himself as a temple, but we are taught in scriptures that as believers, we become temples of the Holy Spirit. God dwells within each of us. And as I contemplate Jesus' words, is there, is there anything that he would identify in me and say, take these things out? What doesn't belong in my life? Well, bitterness, unforgiveness. The Bible says to get rid of that stuff. Prejudice, judgment, addictive substances, clearly. Because they're controlling me rather than God controlling my life. Is there anything in your life that God would say, take these things out? Because it's all about worship. Our lives belonging to Him. But hold it. By what authority does Jesus have to question us and to say these sorts of things? What gives Him the right? Who is He to kick over tables and cause chaos? And Jesus answers. Have you ever thought about the number three? Have you ever thought about the number three? Heavenly Father, help us to take you seriously and to live our lives as an act of worship. Not doing what's easy, not Surrendering to what's convenient, but putting our best forward, regardless of the difficulty. We ask this in Jesus' name, because you are worthy. You are worthy. You gave your life. You created life for us. 
You gave your life so that we would have abundant and eternal life. You are worthy. And so we worship you.